Okay, well, welcome to the second lecture in the series on respiration and lung function. And so the upload date of this video is going to be November uh, 25th and 2020. And so this corresponds to lecture 20. Uh, so just a reminder, if you haven't done the course evaluation, uh, please do it. Great opportunity to provide us with feedback. Um, so today we're going to go into more detail about the movement of gases in and out of the lungs and we're also going to talk about uh, the issue of, of gas exchange. So uh, we're still on chapter 22. The pages are indicated there and give special attention to those figures listed here. So uh, 22.17 and 22.19. And as usual, I've indicated a web resource to augment your knowledge in learning about lung function. Okay, so we ended off last time talking about pressures. And if you remember, I was talking about how we have atmospheric pressure and eventually atmospheric pressure is always going to equalize with the pressure that's in the interior of the lung. So we can call these uh, pressures interpulmonary pressure. Um, there's also a pressure that we talk about that is uh, interpleural pressure. So this is in this gray area here and trans uh, pleural pressure. Um, and this is the, the, the pressure differential between the pink and the gray in this instance. And we talk about how uh, the balance of these pressures is important to prevent lung collapse. And so if the pressure in the, the, the um, pleural cavity here is equal to or greater than what we have in the interpulmonary pressure, so that pressure that's pushing outwards on the alveoli, then the lungs are going to collapse. And you can get this with a, an injury on the outer edge of, of the lung or on the interior surface. Uh, so when we refer to, to lung collapse, this is actually something, there, there's a name for this other than lung collapse. There's a medical term called atelectasis. Um, this can be due to, to things like plugged bronchioles, which can cause the collapse of alveoli. So that's something that's not shown on the previous slide. And then there, there's pneumothorax. And so that is what's shown on the other slide. And so uh, pneumothorax is air in the pleural cavity, that bag-like structure that's covering each of the lungs separately. And if you remember, one lung can collapse while the other one remains intact. Um, and so uh, eventually uh, this is something that, that can be healed and in most cases this is actually a reversible process as well. So there's hope. Um, so we also talked about pulmonary ventilation. Uh, again, this is uh, consisting of inspiration and expiration. Um, this is uh, bringing air in and bringing air out, okay? Um, and this is necessary to bring air into your respiratory system, ultimately down to those alveoli where you're going to get the, the gas exchange that is actually happening. Um, and so what, what's neat about this process is it's really kind of a, a mechanical process that breaks down into pretty simple physics. And the basic idea is that volume changes and pressure changes are linked together. And this is what governs gas flow uh, within most systems and, and also within your respiratory system as well. So all of this is related to something called Boyle's Law. And, and you've probably heard about Boyle's Law before. And if you haven't heard about it, then, then certainly you, you, you know about it. And so the idea is that gases will always fill the container that they are in. Um, and so as a, a kind of the other side of this is that uh, pressure is going to vary inversely with volume. And so if you take a few air molecules and you put them in a very small space, there's going to be more pressure. If you put those same air molecules in something the size of a baseball stadium, the pressure on the outside walls of the baseball stadium is going to be less. And so mathematically, we represent this idea that gases will always uh, take up the space of the container they're in with PV equals PV, so 1 and 2. So pressure inside vessel 1 or container 1 times the volume in container one equals pressure in vessel two ver uh, times the volume in vessel two. And so what this equation tells us is that as volume increase occurs, pressure decreases and vice versa. So that goes back to this example I just gave of air molecules within something small, like a balloon, versus something the size of the baseball stadium. Okay, And these are the same kind of laws of physics that are going to govern the flow of air in and out of our thoracic cavity. Okay, so how is all this controlled? 
Well, uh, there's, there's two main features that change the volume of our thoracic cavity, and those changes in volume will drive changes in pressure. Changes in pressure will allow air to move either in or out of the lungs. And so uh, the first is the action of the diaphragm. So we've come across the diaphragm in a variety of different lectures. The diaphragm is this uh, kind of plate-like muscle that is, is right on the, uh, sitting against the base of the lungs, okay? Um, and the idea is that as this contracts, it's actually gonna move down and out, okay? Um, there's also the intercostal muscles. These are muscles that are in between your ribs. So these are ribs. And these are the external, these are the external um, intercostals. And as these contract, your rib cage is going to move outwards. And so let's consider what happens when you have your diaphragm moving down and when you have your external intercostals moving outwards. And so what happens is that the diaphragm is going to move down and your rib cage is going to go out. And so that's going to expand the space. And as the, the space expands, the pressure is going to decrease. We're going from balloon to baseball stadium, although on a much smaller scale. Since that's the case, the pressure is going to be decreased in your thoracic cavity and air will flow inwards. When you're exhaling, things go in the opposite direction. The, the, those uh, uh, rib muscles, those are going to contract, or sorry, those are going to relax. And so your chest cavity is going to start to collapse inwards and your diaphragm relaxing is going to push upwards. And again, the result in this case is going to be that you have a smaller volume. As you have a smaller volume, what's going to happen? The pressure is going to increase. If the pressure increases relative to what's happening outside, then air is going to move out. So it's these changes in your ribs and in your diaphragm that is controlling the flow in and out of your thoracic cavity, okay? And that's basically what is said down here. And so let's look at this in a, a, a different uh, light. And so this is, again, addressing objective 6.4. We're, we're looking at what's happening in terms of inspiration. So this is taking air into the system. We have the diaphragm that is going down and out when it contracts, and these rib muscles are expanding the size of the thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity volume is then is going to increase. As it is increased, the volume is going to increase with the lungs. And this is because those lungs are going to be stretched. So what happens to the pressure? The pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure is going to go down. Now, because we call the atmospheric pressure zero, the intrapulmonary pressure, this is the pressure within those alveoli, those sac-like structures, this is going to go down. As this goes down, what happens is that air is going to flow into your body, okay? And this is going to continue to happen until the pressure equalizes between the atmosphere and the intrapulmonary pressure, or the intraalveolar pressure, as we can call it as well. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, the atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside the lungs, easier to say that way, uh, this, these are always going to equal each other, okay, in the end. So you make a change and then what's going to happen is that you're going to have equalization of the pressure. Equalization of the pressure will result in flow either in, in this case, or out of the, uh, the body, okay. So we went over this a little bit previously when we were looking at the other di diagram. Um, when the diaphragm is relaxed and the, uh, the muscles within the, the ribs are relaxed, your size of your chest cavity is going to decrease. You're gonna have a decreased volume. Decreased volume is gonna result in an increased pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure. And so we're gonna have fluid. In this case, it's going to be, uh, the, that fluid is air it is going to be moving out of your, your system, okay? Um, so, uh, expiration, uh, this, this process that I'm describing here, uh, this is normally what's called a quiet or passive process. And so, um, this is basically just everything that's happening during inhalation, relaxing, okay? Um, but we also know that both inspiration and expiration can be forced or stronger, we can breathe in really deeply or breathe out really strongly, and we'll address what happens in those cases momentarily. 
Uh, and so just a, a quick summary figure again about the expiration. What's happening here is that these uh, muscles are, um, the diaphragm is going back up. So from down to up and the ribs and sternum are gonna be depressed as these rib muscles are relaxing, okay? So again, what you're gonna get is a change, a decrease in the volume of the thoracic cavity. That's gonna result in an increase in pressure, okay? And as we have an increase in pressure, gas is gonna flow out of that thoracic cavity, okay? You're always equaling pressure with the atmosphere, okay? And so this is what's driving changes in the way that gas is flowing in and out of your thoracic cavity. So, um, as I mentioned, inspiration and expiration can be quiet that's the, or, or passive. Um, so what we mean by that is that that's inspiration and expiration that's hap happening just as, as you're sitting there watching the, uh, the lecture, okay? Unless you happen to be on a treadmill or something like this. Um, and so we can also have forced or deep inspiration and so this is something that occurs during exercise, okay? And so what this means basically is that you can increase the amount of uh, uh, gas that is flowing into your thoracic cavity. And when you do this, you'll notice that, you know, when you breathe in very deeply or when you're working out, for example, you'll notice that you have all sorts of other muscles that are activated that normally you don't, you don't notice. This is sometimes why you're, you're sore after you work out is because suddenly you're involving all sorts of new muscles that normally aren't active during a passive situation. But the point is that these are all causing a further increase in the size of your thoracic cage. Okay, so you're, you're, you're increasing that thoracic cage, you're getting a, a larger pressure gradient, and so even more air is drawn in. What's the purpose of that extra air? That air has oxygen, and that's gonna be used by those muscles that are hopefully active on, on the treadmill that you're using. Same thing on the other end, you can have forced expiration. So you can breathe in normally, but you can forcibly breathe out. When you do that, you'll notice that this is also an active process. And you'll notice all sorts of new muscles coming into play, particularly in your abs, okay? So again, this is a smaller than normal cavity when you're pushing out in this way. That smaller cavity has an increased pressure. And you're gonna push even more air outside of your thoracic cavity. And so it's these changes in volume that's driving uh, changes in pressure and the changes in pressure are resulting in the way that air moves either in or out of our thoracic cavity. When it moves into our thoracic cavity, obviously it's gonna be available for gas exchange. And that's what we want. We wanna get that oxygen in there. And we wanna get carbon dioxide out of our system. Okay, so let's look at this uh, in another way. As you're inspiring, what's happening is that relative to the atmospheric pressure, you're dropping the pressure you know, just one or two millimeters mercury. And that's causing an increase in volume. The, or sorry, you're, 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 uh, you're increasing the volume and that's going to cause a decrease in pressure. As we have a decrease in pressure, air is gonna flow in. And then on the other side, what we have is when you're expiring, you're gonna have a decrease in volume. Decrease in volume will result in an increase in pressure and that's when the breath is going out. All this happens very quickly in the span of about five seconds. And again, we're talking about very small changes in, uh, in pressure. So a change in one or two millimeters mercury is enough to draw, to draw in about 500 mils of, of uh, air, okay? And so this is, uh, um, I, I think I referred to air as fluid earlier. And so obviously it's not a fluid, it's a gas. Um, and so, um, the air is going out based in or out based on this very small change in pressure. Okay, so just a few millimeters mercury. An important thing to note is that uh, the, the, the changes that we see in the intrapulmonary pressure, so that's in this pink area here, we see the same types of changes happening in the intrapleural pressure. Okay, and this is because uh, this, this uh, pressure within this area, this sac that's covering the lungs, this is also going to change as you're breathing in and out. It's gonna mirror what's happening in the intrapleural pressure, or in the intrapulmonary pressure, but uh, you're still gonna have an intrapleural pressure that is much lower relative to, to what's happening in the intrapulmonary area.
okay? And again, this is something that's actually really important because if we don't have this, then the lung is gonna collapse. If the pressure is higher in this gray area here, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna be pushing on this pink area towards the right side of the screen and your lung's gonna collapse. As we mentioned a few times now, you can have one lung that's collapsing and the other one remaining uh, intact. And this is because both lungs are, are covered with a, a different pleura, okay? So they each have their own bag surrounding them, essentially. So again, all of this is happening very, very quickly. Just a very small change in, in pressure is enough to drive a half liter moving in and out of your system. And as we'll see, this half liter really constitutes the, the main change that we get when we're just sitting here, you know, watching a lecture, watching TV or something like this. Um, okay, uh, besides those pressure changes, there, there's kind of three physical factors which can influence how air moves in or out of our systems. Um, and so the first is airway resistance. So there's that term resistance again, and we've talked about that previously in terms of, of blood vessels as an example. Um, we have alveolar surface tension um, and lung compliance. And so we'll address each of these, one, two, and three, uh, in turn. And so airway resistance, this is essentially friction. And so, so we think of this as, as non-elastic source of resistance to gas, gas movement. Um, and, and this takes on kind of a, a familiar um, equation. And so we have F, which equals flow, is resulting from the change in pressure. So that's the pressure that is, for example, outside in the atmosphere versus inner lungs uh, over the resistance, okay? And so the resistance is going to be generated um, in, in your bronchioles. And if you remember, that's very similar to what we saw um, when we were talking about the cardiac uh, regulation, okay? So in that scenario, we saw that blood flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance. Here we're talking about airflow, but the equation remains the same, okay? Um, and so gas flow is gonna change inversely with resistance, but it's going to change directly with the change in pressure. Okay, so airway resistance. Um, so just as we saw resistance when, when we go through the arterial system, we have resistance as we're going through the bronchial system. So in the first part of uh, your, your uh, respiratory system, um, when you're undergoing ventilation, the diameters of the airways involved, so this means like your trachea, for example, the diameter is so large that you really don't have any real resistance there. So that really doesn't come into play. Um, and as we, we, we have progressive branching, um, the, the total cross-sectional area is gonna increase um, but the resistance is going to, to increase, okay? Because again, we're getting smaller and smaller diameter. Uh, and so um, usually what's happening is that you're having resistance, which is occurring in the, the medium-sized bronchi, okay? And so these are, this is actually in contrast to what we saw with blood flow. With blood flow, we saw that the most resistance was happening down in the arterioles. And so here, I'm saying that the most resistance is in the bronchi of medium size, not down in those terminal bronchioles. And this is because once you get all the way down here, uh, diffusion takes over and that's really driving gas movement. Okay, so these bronchioles are in close contact with the alveolar surface. Since they're in close contact with the alveolar surface, you get very rapid gas movement in that area. So the most resistance that you get is in the medium-sized bronchi, and, and this is one of the factors that's, that's driving resistance. However, um, uh, the overall contribution of, of, of resistance in terms of, of diameter of airways, this is usually um, relatively insignificant compared to factors two and three that we're gonna talk about next. So one of the, the largest uh, drivers of, of resistance in terms of gas movement is surface tension. And so the alveolar surface is covered with, with a thin layer of water, so very, very thin. Um, and so again, this is important for gas movement during respiration. The function of that water is that it's, it's gonna, or, or the outcome of the water on the alveolar surface is that it's gonna draw those molecules close together. So they're gonna wanna stay together, much like the water on the lip of a cup that's not quite pouring over, okay? So this is because water has a very high surface tension 
Um, and, and so those alveoli are going to try to shrink down to their very smallest size. Okay, so that's something that prevents airflow in, in the system. Okay, um, and so one thing that, that counters that surface tension is something called surfactant. And so again, this is a detergent or soap-like lipid and protein complex, and, and it functions to reduce the surface tension of that alveolar fluid. And this is going to prevent the collapse of those alveol alveoli that are covered in this water-like film. Okay. If you remember last time, I talked about this being produced by type 2 alveolar cells. And so these are these cells, these green cells in this diagram here. So just as a review, we have the blood vessels here. They share a basement membrane with the alveoli. This large um, structure here is the alveoli. Here are some pores between the alveoli. Uh, these very close connections are important because they allow for rapid gas exchange between uh, the blood and the lungs, okay? And it's these, uh, so this entire surface here that you're seeing, basically the entire diagram, would be coated, coated with a very thin layer of water. Um, and, and it's the job of the surfactant secreting cells, these green guys with the kind of bluish dots here, that it are to, to release this soap-like material that's gonna help uh, break that surface tension and facilitate airflow. Okay, so that's the second thing that, that, that uh, provides resistance within the airflow system. Um, there's a neat link to, to homeostasis here. And so there's something that's relatively common to, in premature infants that's called IRDS. And this is basically when um, you have uh, too much surface tension in, in the alveoli. And this is because uh, uh, these infants are not producing enough surfactant. And so what you can do is you can give them adequate you can give them artificial surfactant, um, and you can you can treat with increased ventilation, which we'll talk about later. And this can correct this con condition until the the infants are able to produce their own surfactant. Okay. Um, so the third factor um, that's that's uh, really important in terms of airflow um, is is something called lung compliance, uh, and, and this is basically means stretchiness. So how much stretch does that does that lung tissue have. Um, usually it's very high and that's because you know you have a lot of elastic tissue within within your lungs okay within those bronchi um, and again you also have this surfactant which is is decreasing the alveolar surface tension. Those two things work together to make your lungs pretty stretchy overall. Um, and so if we say a higher lung with somebody has a high lung compliance this means it can expand very well okay and, and that's measured at various pressures. And so as an example, um, this is what a normal lung profile looks like. As you, you increase the pressure, uh, you're going to expand to a certain volume. And if you have a low lung compliance, this is something that you might have in, in fibrosis of the, of the lungs. Okay, So if they're very stiff, if they can't move, um, then even though you have a lot of pressure, that volume is not changing. Okay, so imagine an actual lung versus, you know, uh, some sort of a plastic cast, for example. Um, this one's kind of interesting, emphysema. Emphysema actually has um, an increased compliance relative to normal. And you might think, well, that's good. You know, higher lung compliance, that doesn't that mean it's good? Um, the, the issue with emphysema, as we'll see, is that uh, although you're having good compliance, a lot of the tissue that, that we have in this scenario of emphysema is not actively participating in gas exchange. So you're expanding actually better than normal, but that tissue is not very useful in, in participating in respiration, okay? Um, we can measure ventilation. You know, you might kind of notice a theme with this lecture. It's very similar to kind of the outline of, of the lecture of the heart. You know, we're talking about the, the, the anatomy and then we're talking about the pressures and then we're talking about how to, to, to measure these changes. Um, and so you can measure ventilation um, and you can look at various uh, respiratory volumes, how much you can take in, how much you can push out, these types of things. Um, just as when we're talking about the ECG with the heart, there's a machine that does this. It's called a spirometer. Um, Back in the olden days, whenever you want to say that those were, this used to be a kind of a very cumber, cumbersome analog machine. Now this is, is, is all electronic, okay? So, so these very simple machines hooked up to a laptop can actually provide you a wealth of information that can, can give insights into to how the lungs are behaving and if they're achieving homeostasis in the way that they're supposed to. 
So uh, what are the types of, of volumes that, that uh, you can measure with these machines? Well, you can measure all the kinds of volumes that, that we've kind of been hinting at but haven't really defined. And so I said that when you're sitting quietly and you're watching this lecture, unless you're doing it on a treadmill or something, you're, you're, you're using what's called a tidal volume. And this is just the amount of air that goes in and out of your body in a, in a normal situation, in and out of your, your thoracic cavity. Okay, And so this is called the tidal volume, uh, and that's about 500 mils. Uh, then you have other volumes that, that are based on our ability to take in a lot of air with extra effort or push out a lot of air with extra effort. And so you have what's called the inspiratory reserve volume. So if the tidal volume is 500 mils, the inspiratory reserve volume is just over 3,000 mils, so a lot more. What's that? That's the amount that I'm going to get in if I go like this, okay? And in that scenario, what I'm doing is I'm really expanding my rib cage, I'm dropping my diaphragm, and so I'm getting a lot more air coming in. I'm making a, a bigger pressure differential. That bigger pressure differential is allowing more air to come into my system. We have something kind of analogous on the other end. We have an expiratory reserve volume. And I kind of did a demonstration of that previously. That's kind of <sighs> pushing out like this, okay? Um, that's pushing out as much air as you can. Again, you're using all sorts of different muscles, in particular your abdominal muscles. Um, and again, that's going to be a decrease in the size of that thoracic cavity as much as possible. You're causing a, a greater pressure, pressure differential. And in this case, you're pushing more uh, uh, air um, out of your body. Okay, not fluid, like I, I said incorrectly previously. Um, and so all these things then are given uh, different names. And so you have, uh, for example, uh, the, the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume is the inspiratory capacity. So that's the total amount, just over 3.5 liters that you can take in at, at one time. Uh, you have the vital capacity. That's kind of the difference between the, the, the peak that you can take in and, and the, the, the max that you can push out. Uh, you have a residual capacity, which is the expiratory volume, and something called the residual volume. The residual volume is the amount of air that's gonna stay in your lungs, no matter how far you push out, okay? So there's always gonna be some air that remains stuck, and that's called the residual volume. Adding all these things together, these give you the total lung capacity, and this is just uh, about six liters in size. Okay, so it's interesting that that the you know the 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 size of the, the lung capacity is actually very similar to the, the amount of blood we have. So six liters versus uh, versus uh, six liters in each case. So so these are these different volumes here. Okay, and so in the next couple slides, I, I'm just kind of pointing these out, and so I guess I've already gone gone over this. Um, and so you know uh, the important thing is you can use a spirometer to calculate all these different uh, values. And, and, you know, again, much like the ECG, this is something that's actually quite complicated, the math behind it. But but the point is that, that you can do it or, or the machine can do it. And by having all this information, by knowing what is somebody's inspiratory volume, what is their tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, um, things like this, we can tell something about the, the health of those lungs. Okay. Um, and so this is just all the information that I've just gone over on the first slide here. Okay, so I went over everything in the first slide. These next set of slides just, just uh, are reiterating it. Okay, um, and so this is what I've just said here. The clinical importance of spirometry is that it can tell us when things have gone wrong. And so as an example, if you have an obstructive pulmonary disease, such as uh, bronchitis or asthma, so this is increased airway resistance, um, you, you actually you, you have changes in, in these um, in these different values and actually contrary to expectation um, in in asthma it, unless you're having an act, an active asthma attack your total lung capacity um, and your reserve volume uh, may actually increase over time and this is because of inappropriate hyperinflation of the lungs over time on the other end, you can have a restrictive disease such as fibrosis. And so this is a change in lung compliance for the worse. So your lungs are, are not very, very, uh, can, cannot be stretched very much. And, and here you're getting a, a, a very clear decrease in total lung capacity. 
Okay, so make sure you know these differences. And so it's easy to get tripped up thinking that something like asthma or bronchitis might give you a, a um, an increased total lung capacity, or sorry, a decreased total lung capacity. It's actually giving us the opposite. It's giving us an increase in lung capacity because of, of inappropriate hyperinflation of the lungs over time. Okay. Um, you know, so 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 you can get those kind of uh, uh, numbers, the, 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 the volume, the tidal volume, for example, the total lung capacity. Um, you can also put rates on these. So when we put a rate on something, this means uh, a volume uh, over a change in time. Okay. And so there's values such as the forced vital capacity. This is the amount of gas forcibly expelled after taking a deep breath. So if I breathe in, and breathe out as much as possible. This is the forced vital, vital capacity. Um, the forced expiratory volume is the amount of gas that I am ex um, expelling during a specific time interval when I'm breathing out, okay? And so based on whether you have more or less coming in uh, or going out of your system in the first second, then that can determine whether you're healthy or whether you have some sort of an obstructive disease, okay? Um, and so as an example, healthy individuals expel about 80% of their FVC in the first sec second, but patients with obstructive diseases, again, asthma is an example, they inhale less um, uh, than this, so, so less than 80% in the first second. Those with restrictive diseases, um, uh, exhale 80% or more, even with, with uh, an overall reduced uh, FVC, okay? So again, uh, the details here, not as important as the overall point. Overall point being that when you start to attach numbers to this, uh, or numbers in terms of, of time, then you can learn more about a lung function, okay? So the original things I was talking about here, this tells us uh, something about how our lungs are functioning. Once we start to measure those values over time, that's telling us more information. And as a physician has more information, they're better able to diagnose any disease that one might have. Okay, another concept here is this idea of dead space. Um, and so a dead space is, is defined as um, uh, uh, areas of your respiratory system that are air within your respiratory system that is not participating in, in gas exchange with your blood, okay? Um, and, and this is, is usually about 150 mils out of your 500 mils total volume or, 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 or tidal volume, okay? So again, this tidal volume is the amount that you're bringing in and out of your lungs just sitting normally, just watching this lecture. Um, you can have different types of dead space. You can have, you have alveolar dead space. So this is basically if your alveoli is, is non-functioning. So imagine half your, your imagine one of your lungs was not working. You breathe in 500 mils, 250 of it is going into one lung, 250 into the other. Well, you're only getting gas exchange with half of that, 250 mils, okay? Um, and so alveolar um, dysfunction can be uh, due to, to, to collapse or, or obstruction of those alveoli, okay? Um, you also have, uh, uh, so there's anatomical dead space. Uh, um, so the alveolar space is one type. The anatomical dead space is, is another another type. So anatomical dead space, I didn't really explain it terribly well. Uh, this is, is um, uh, areas where, um, such as your trachea, for example, there's no, there's no alveoli in your trachea. So if you have a little bit of air there or in the, in the upper areas of your bronchioles, it's not going to participate in, in gas exchange. Okay. So two types of dead space, anatomical and alveolar dead space. Um, you add those together and you get total dead space. So that's just the sum of the anatomical and the alveolar dead space. Um, and this is something, again, which, which can be measured. We're not going to go into the details of how it's measured, but basically this is, is, is by metabolic changes in carbon dioxide. So why does this even matter? Um, it, it matters because, um, you know, there, there's different types of ventilations we can measure. And again, this kind of continues this theme that we can measure very basic things that tell us one thing. And as we start to attach more and more information to us, to it, it can it can give us more and more information, uh, or more and more uh, 
uh, insight into to what the lungs are doing. Um, and so um, the basic idea is that um, if you want to be, be have a real estimate of what your lungs are doing, you need to take that tidal volume and you need to minus out the dead space in any uh, uh, calculation that you do, okay? Um, and so let's actually go one step further and take a look at why this is important. It's important because uh, it tells us something about physiology as well. Um, and one thing it tells us, if you look at this chart, it tells us that if we want to increase ventilation, so getting more air into the alveoli where it can participate in gas exchange, um, we can do this by taking very slow, deep breaths, uh, as opposed to rapid, shallow breaths, okay? So let's imagine you want to get more into your system. You don't want to breathe very fast. You don't want to go <sighs> like this. You want to breathe in nice and slow like this. And what this is in effect doing is it's taking into account the dead space. And it's, you know, if you're breathing very shallow and rapid, you're moving air in and out of your system, but most of it is never getting down to those alveoli where it can actually participate in the gas exchange reaction, okay? So in this case, the point is that slow and deep breathing uh, gives increased ventilation rate relative to the normal rate of breathing and or, or ventilation and this is because of, of the effect of, of dead space. If dead space wasn't here, then, then it actually wouldn't, wouldn't make a difference. Okay. Um, there's also non-respiratory air movements that are important. Um, and you know this is, is um, things like laughing, crying, um, various reflex actions. We won't go into detail. Um, coughing, sneezing, crying, hiccups, yawns all non-respiratory air movements, but they can impact the amount of air that goes down into your alveoli um, that is ultimately participating in gas exchange. So these things can be important. And so if you have chronic hiccups, for example, uh, then, then you're not gonna be able to get as much air into your system as you need to, to satisfy the needs of your system, okay? Um, so let's talk about gas exchange. So at this point, we, we've got the air into our lungs where it needs to go. And, and now the point is that you actually need to have that gas exchange reaction happening with the blood. Okay. And so this is, you know, before we were talking about ventilation, now we're really going to be, be gearing down and talking about, um, uh, uh, external respiration. So again, external respiration is going to be moving gases from the lungs into the blood. Okay, um, and so that's external, internal respiration, as we mentioned previously. This is talking about movements of the gas between the blood and the tissues. So what's in between those? It's the transport of that oxygen in the blood um, using your circulatory system. And this is something that the next lecture is actually going to, to focus on. And so external respiration and, and actually ultimately internal respiration as well the, these are um, also subject to, to very basic elements of physics, okay? So it's going to be uh, focused on the basic properties of gases and also the uh, composition of alveolar gases as well. Um, and in particular, what's relevant here is something called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Dalton's Law of Partial, partial Pressures um, actually says that the total pressure that is exerted by a gas is the sum of each of the individual pressures, okay? Um, and so the pressure exerted by each gas is directly proportional to the percentage in the mixture, okay? So if, if your gas is mostly oxygen, then that's going to be exerting most of the pressure. And it's that pressure, ultimately, which is going to be driving its movement. Um, and so let's, let's take a break here and look at what is just air anyway. Um, so your air is actually mostly going to be made up of nitrogen. Um, oxygen is coming in at uh, 20%, and other gases such as carbon dioxide and, and uh, water here, listed as water vapor, this rounds us out to, to 100. And you see here that it's the partial pressures of these are all going to, to reflect their percentage. And so the biggest partial pressure is uh, from nitrogen, and this is because it makes up the greatest percentage. The next one is oxygen, because that's second, and so on down to the water vapor. So you have these partial pressures uh, on the atmosphere, 
and then you have uh, the partial pressures down in the alveoli. Okay, um, and these are going to be a little bit different, and this is despite the fact that you're taking air into your system. By the time it gets down to the alveoli, things are different. And let's think why that would be. The reason why it's that's the case is because what's happening at the alveoli is going to be a mix of air that's coming into your system, and you know, for for lack of a better word, waste air that is coming out of your system. So that waste air coming um, out has carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, and so uh, this is what uh, this is saying here. The mixing of the alveolar gases with each breath is occurring. You have newly inspired air, so air that you're just taking into your system. And this is, uh, this is mixing with the air that's coming out of your system, left in your passageways between breaths. Okay, so that's why you have a little bit of changes in the partial pressures um, relative to, to what we have here, in particular for the carbon dioxide and the water vapor. Okay, so very, very low in air. They are, are substantially higher down in the alveoli. And again, these exact numbers actually turn out to be quite important because the, the movement of that air is going to be directly proportional to its partial pressure. The, the movement of the component of the air is going to be directly proportional to the, the partial pressure. Um, and, and part of this is, uh, is related to Henry's law. Uh, Henry's law uh, says that the um, each gas will dissolve in a liquid in proportion to its partial pressure. So let's back up. We talked about Dar Dalton's law. Dalton is telling us that the pressure within a vessel is related to uh, the uh, the pressure exerted by each gas within that vessel. And Henry's law is telling us that the pressure of each of those gases is going to determine the amount which is dissolved in liquid. So if you have more oxygen, it's got a higher pressure. That's Dalton. And Henry tells us that more of that is going to become dissolved in the liquid. Okay, so that's the difference between uh, Dalton's law and Henry's law. Both are important for, for determining how much gas is going to be dissolved in a liquid. Um, the amount of gas uh, also depends on solubility. Okay, um, so for example, carbon dioxide is uh, much more soluble in water than is oxygen. So you can have a very small pressure differential with carbon dioxide, and you're going to have more of it ultimately that's going to dissolve uh, in, or at least equal amounts that's going to dissolve in liquid due to the fact that it is more soluble. The other thing that can impact gas solubility is temperature. So as temperature rises, the solubility is going to decrease. So colder um, fluids can actually uh, retain gases better. Um, so um, we're going to uh, end the lecture by focusing on what is, is impacting external respiration. So external respiration, again, this is the movement uh, between the lungs in the alveoli and eventually into the bloodstream. Um, and so we're talking about kind of the first stage of, of gas exchange. Um, so we're talking about partial pressure gradients and gas solubilities, thickness of surface area and respiratory membrane, and something called ventilation and perfusion coupling. And so we'll talk about each of those in turn. So again, this is focusing on external respiration. This is movement of uh, gas, you know, oxygen, for example, in the lungs to the blood. And it's impacted by three things, partial pressure gradients, gas solubilities, thickness and surface area, and ventilation perfusion coupling. So partial pressures. Um, so uh, here's where these things start to come together that we've talked about in terms of the differences between uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide in terms of their partial pressure and also uh, their solubility. So oxygen uh, has a, a very large pressure di differential. And so the venous blood uh, that is going through the capillaries has a low partial pressure. This is 40 millimeters mercury. And in the alveolar, uh, uh, in the alveoli of the lungs, the, the pressure is high, so it's 104 millimeters mercury. Where is this coming from? Back here in this chart. So 104, and the venous blood has 40. So the pressure is higher in the air or um, in, you know, both in the air and that, um, that thin layer of, uh, of, of liquid 
um, that is, is surrounding all the alveoli. So in which direction is this oxygen going to move? It's going to move into the venous blood. So 140, or sorry, 104 versus 40, that's a pretty steep differential. So it really drives that oxygen flow into the blood, and it does so very, very quickly. In fact, that equilibrium is, is reached within 0.25 seconds. This is despite the fact that a red blood cell is in transit across that capillary in 0.75 seconds. So the job gets done in a third of the time that it takes the red blood cell to, to cross the capillary. Um, so another way of looking at this is like this. And so we have a little diagram here. As your oxygenated blood is rounding the alveoli, uh, or sorry, as, as the blood is rounding the alveoli, you have deoxygenated blood, the carbon dioxide is dropped off, and it's picking up oxygen. And it's able to do that because you have very high pressure here at 104, and this venous blood coming through here has a pressure of 40, okay? And so 104 versus 40, that means that oxygen is going to be driven into the blood and it is going to, to equalize across that membrane, okay? So by the time things are around in this corner here, the, the, the uh, oxygenated blood is going to have its own partial pressure of about 104 uh, millimeters mercury, okay? Um, and so uh, this diagram here shows what I was talking about in terms of time. All this is happening within a very, you know, one-fourth one of a second, despite the fact that uh, three-quarters of a second is the time it takes to make this transit event. So all the action is happening by here, despite the fact that, that the red blood cell could be picking up more oxygen, but it doesn't need to. It becomes uh, completely saturated uh, by the time it's gone around this corner, okay? And this is because of very high pressure differential. Uh, so you have 40 versus 104, and that's what's driving that pressure difference, okay? Um, the other thing that's um, uh, going to drive uh, external respiration is the thickness and surface area of the respiratory membrane. And so a thin membrane is good. It's going to promote gas exchange. And so obviously, if you have something that's very thin, it's easier for gas to move across it. Um, and so... This is uh, reflected in the fact that the alveoli, they're very, very thin, but they also have a very high surface area. And so they're less than uh, one thousandth of a millimeter in thickness, so 0 0.5 to 1 micron thick. And they have a total surface area that is, is about half the size of a tennis court. Okay, So a huge amount of surface area, very thin, and this is going to really facilitate the transit of gases across that membrane. Okay, so this is the second thing that, that's impacting external respiration. Um, and so again, we have some links to homeostasis here. Um, and so there's two, imagine two different situations where you can change either the thickness or the size of the membrane. So we can change the thickness if the, the lungs become waterlogged. And so this is what's happening in the case of pneumonia. If you have water that is building up in your lungs, the, the effective thickness of that membrane is going to increase. And so the transfer of oxygen is going to be much slower. And so in this case, your tissues are going to suffer from oxygen deprivation. In a second situation is emphysema. So I touched on this a little bit earlier. This is where the alveoli walls will break down. Okay, so I talked about this situation as having high lung compliance. Um, you can really stretch out your lungs, but it doesn't matter. All the tissue is very highly damaged. And so the effective surface area, the amount of area which can actually participate in gas exchange is substantially reduced. Okay, so let's back up just a bit for a second. So we said there's a variety of factors which can impact gas exchange in terms of external respiration. We said the first of this is partial pressures. This is the difference between pressure in the alveoli versus what we have in the bloodstream. The greater that difference, the greater movement we're going to have across that barrier, okay? The second thing is the thickness and the surface area of the respiratory membrane. We said that this membrane in the alveoli is very thin, but it's very uh, large in size. So again, about the size of half a tennis court. Um, so the third thing is something called ventilation and perfusion coupling, 
Okay, and so what this is is talking about is basically saying the amount of, of gas that's able to get into your bloodstream it depends on how well uh, the the blood and uh, the air, which is going down into your alveoli, how well are those arriving at the alveoli at the same time? And so if we go back actually to this diagram, this uh, schematic here, uh, you see that you have your deoxygenated blood arriving at the alveolus, but if it's arriving there at a time when there's no air here, then that's not going to be very productive. The fact that these things are arriving at the same time, deoxygenated blood and the and the the oxygen that's going to oxygenate it, um, that's called ventilation perfusion coupling. Okay, and so um, uh, so perfusion, blood flow reaching the alveoli ventilation amount of gas uh, reaching the alveoli, you want those to be matched uh, at the same time, okay? Um, and these are both controlled by what we, we call autoregulatory mechanisms. We've talked about these individually previously in the blood vessel section. Um, and so uh, one example here is that you can have oxygen, which is controlling uh, perfusion by changing the diameter of the arterioles, okay? So as... Um, as you get more oxygen into the alveoli, what can happen is that that oxygen is gonna react uh, with sensors in, in the arteries, and that's gonna cause them to, um, that's gonna cause them to, to expand. Um, and as they expand, that's gonna facilitate um, more uh, blood coming in. More blood coming in is going to facilitate ventilation perfusion coupling. Uh, carbon dioxide works in the opposite way um, because it's changing bronchial diameter, okay? So when CO2 is high in the blood what, and, and then it starts to come out into the alveoli, what's going to happen is that those, um, those bronchioles are going to, to increase in diameter and that's going to help you get rid of this waste carbon dioxide, okay? Um, and so this is what I've just talked about here. So high alveolar O2, uh, this is where the arteries are going to uh, uh, dilate, the, uh, and where uh, O2 is low, the arterioles are going to uh, restrict. Um, and so the idea here is that you're always directing blood uh, to the alveoli um, where oxygen is high. And so, so the, the, the end result is that blood is going to pick up more oxygen. Okay. On the other side, we talked about CO2. Uh, where alveolar CO2 is high, those bronchioles will dilate, and this is going to allow elimination of more carbon dioxide. And so this is called ventilation and perfusion coupling. Um, and so one final point here is that this occurs on a very local level. And so this isn't something that, that's normalized across the, the entire lungs. It's, it's, you know, I put here, aka, it's all about local control. And the idea here is that you can have some alveoli which are, are, are better coupled than others, and this isn't going to influence what's happening on the other side of the lung. Okay, um, and examples that are that are um, given here, you could have regional variations due to to gravity flow on, on blood or airflow. Um, you could also have some alveolar ducts which are plugged with with mucus or areas of the lungs that that are broken down due to disease, as an example. So. Just very quickly, again, going back through those, three things impacting external respiration. External respiration is the movement of air from the, or of gases from the uh, lungs into the bloodstream. We have differentials in partial pressures. Um, so that's the first factor. We have thickness and surface area of the respiratory membrane. And then finally, we have ventilation and perfusion coupling. Ventilation and perfusion coupling is ensuring that your air and your blood are arriving at the same time to allow that exchange to happen. And so um, that's basically it for this lecture. So the rest of the lecture is just the review questions. And again, we'll go over this in the office hours. Um, you'll see some that you, you've seen before as well. And, and there's a reason for that is, is those are, are likely to come up in exams. Um, and uh, again, summary, uh, today we, we focus mostly on mechanics of breathing, this concept of, of external respiration. Next, we're gonna focus on gas transport 
and then ultimately we'll talk about internal respiration. So, so review those concepts before the next lecture, and I'll see you next time.